Before the video starts, just a quick reminder to go check out The Chilling App. If you can't get enough content from me here on this channel, myself and other narrators here on YouTube are going to be providing hours of unique and spine-tingling scary story narrations exclusively over on The Chilling App. There's new narrations from me added weekly, and there's new professional narrators constantly being added to the list. So far, there's over 400 stories to binge, from monsters, paranormal, thrillers, and true scary stories. The Chilling App even recently added classic novels, vintage horror radio, and true crime stories. And this all can be enjoyed with their one-of-a-kind ambient menu, where you can mix in immersive and relaxing sound effects like rainstorms and crackling fireplaces, and adjust their volumes independently, and a sleep timer so you can drift off to dreamland without interruptions. Click the link in the description or the pinned comment to try the free trial of the Chilling app, and after that, it's only $2.99 a month, which makes it completely ad and interruption free. Also, be sure to enter this month's Chilling giveaway of a PS5 bundle. To enter, all you gotta do is download the app, start their free trial, or be a current subscriber, and fill out the entry form on the website. Best of luck to everyone. It ends on Halloween. To better paint the picture, here is a description of myself at the time of this incident, three years ago. 5'5", five, 26-year-old five, woman, medium-length bleach blonde hair, curvy 175 pounds, wearing black high-waisted tights and a pink crop top. And three years ago I was walking home, late at night from my friend's house. It was dark and at the time I lived in a rough part of a large city. I've had many sketchy situations that I've gotten myself out of, but... I've had many sketchy situations that I have gotten myself out of, so I guess I felt sort of invincible, like nothing truly scary could happen to me. When I walk alone, I always stay very alert, and I'm aware of my surroundings for my own safety just in case. About halfway home and roughly ten minutes to my apartment, I noticed a van start tailing me. I was used to this since in my city it's very common for a young woman in a rough area to get propositioned for sort of a hookup. It's embarrassing how desensitized I was to this. I did my usual and crossed the road so I would be walking beside the traffic heading in the other direction. I wasn't scared, more annoyed. The van then turned down a side street, then back onto the road I was on and pulled up to me. At this point, I still wasn't scared. Again, this has happened so many times and it never mattered if I was wearing something that showed more skin or if I was wearing a winter coat zipped from just below my chin all the way down to my ankles. That area was notorious for that type of activity. I decided to be firm and told the person sternly, I'm not interested. I noticed that there were two men in the van. They looked almost identical and may have been twins or perhaps brothers. Both men have a very, very dark complexion, dark eyes, and short dark hair. The van didn't move. I was super annoyed and crossed the road again to get away. At this point, I figured this would be enough for them to stop following me. But they didn't. They kept circling back every time I crossed the road. I've never had to put that much effort into getting some pervert to leave me alone, so this is when I started feeling unsafe. They zipped by me at the speed the traffic was flowing in, and I yelled for them to screw off. I thought it finally worked. It had been three minutes and I hadn't seen the van so I thought I was in the clear. Just in case, I pulled my phone out and was getting ready to call my sister that I live with. Just then, the van pulled up to me very quickly and before I could even blink one of the men jumped out of the van, opened the back door and approached me quickly in an aggressive manner as if he was about to scoop me up and throw me into the vehicle. The traffic in that area is very inconsistent. It was dead and I imagine that's what they were waiting for. Just as the man was about to place his hands on me, I tilted my phone and said, You're being filmed in my live video chat. I gave my friends your license plate number, and the police have been notified. I was so scared, but I didn't let that show. I stayed as calm as I could. The man paused like he was considering if I was bluffing or telling the truth, so I tilted the phone more as if to give the fake audience a better look at him. He then jumped back into the van, 
closed the door and they sped off. I had never been the same since that night. I'm afraid of walking alone, now even in the daytime. Stay safe out there. And to those two creeps in the van, I hope karma finds you both soon. Before everything, I worked in a late night bar in the city, usually finishing up at around 3 or 4 a.m. or so, depending on the night, sometimes a little later if the staff stopped up for drinks and chats afterwards. My house was across the river and up a steep hill on the north side and was about a 10-15 to 15 minute walk in a little cul-de-sac at the very top of the monster hill. At the time, I also had a housemate that people confused for me all the time because we had similar looks. Both shaven-headed, wore a lot of black, etc. Around this time, she'd been saying that she felt like she was being followed by a guy who came into our work. She had like three different jobs at the time, so her schedule was all over the place. Now, I know some of you will probably say that I'm an idiot, and you'd probably be right. But like many bartenders, I used to walk home all the time, usually by myself at these hours. The rent I was paying for my stupid little room at the time was extortionate levels, it didn't have storage or even a freaking door, as well as bills piling up and I was trying to save whatever I could because I had been hemorrhaging money on taxis, and I'd walked home so many times without major incident that I figured it'd be fine. I am not a very large or particularly fit person, so to say that the odds would not be in my favor in a physical fight would be an understatement. For work, I had this bottle opener utility tool thing with a small blade on it for cutting the foil on top of bottles. Sometimes when I walk home, I hold it in my hand in my pocket to feel a bit safer. This particular night, I locked up and set out home. The place was deserted. I crossed the river and started the trek up the hill. Walking alone at night kind of freaks me out a little, so I always used to power walk up the hill really fast. I'd be exhausted and a ball of sweat afterwards, but I'd be home. I got to the last stretch of hill, which was a straight shot up to my place. It was a pretty poorly lit area, but I could still see the cars parked at the top. As I was walking up the hill, I saw what I thought was an animal on four legs scurrying across the road, really low down to the ground and into my turnoff. I thought maybe it was a neighbor's dog and just kept walking. It scurried back onto the driveway across the road, then back into my cul-de-sac. At this point, I'm like, oh no, that was some weird looking dog and I'm pretty sure it was wearing shoes. It was now in the turnoff I had to take to get home, and at this stage I'm obviously like, that's not a dog. So it was either wait around on the street at 4am by myself and hope it went away, or try to make a run past this dude who had been running around on all fours in the dark. Being full of too much beer and not enough sense, I decided to make a run for it. I'd slap me too, but I can't take my own good advice. Remember the little utility knife I usually carried? Yeah, me neither. Scrambling around desperately in my pocket, I realize I've forgotten it. Also, I haven't broken pace at all, so I'm literally just around the corner from the turnoff. I'm already sweaty and shaking from the long climb and just pretty much done at this point. All I could find in my jacket was a bottle of perfume, one of those made out of chunky glass in the shape of a torso. I fish it out and hold it in my fists in case things take a turn for the worst. Use it as mace, you say? No, I'm going to break his freaking nose with it. I found the corner, and there's nothing there. Empty path, not a peep, nothing. I figured maybe he was just on drugs or something and went for a run around in the field that led to my lane. The gate was right by the corner. I walk on, my house three doors away, thinking I'm in the clear when... This dude literally just strides out of the shadows straight towards me. I don't know how he managed to conceal himself so well, but it scared the life out of me. I actually surprised myself because I lunged at him shouting, Jesus Christ, swinging the thick bit of the bottle down in my fist towards his nose. It didn't connect because I think I scared him too because he saw a glint of something in my hand. He staggered just backwards and stared at me. Googly I just saying, uh, um, over and over like a deer in the headlights. I looked him in the face and said, what are you doing, man? And walked to my house, 
keeping an eye on him, but he just wandered off. I got inside and told my housemate about what happened. She went pale as a ghost when I described him, as it matched very closely the description of the guy who had been stalking and making unwanted romantic gestures towards her while she was at work. We reckoned that this was the same guy and he must have been watching her from afar, but confused me for her, like everyone else, and thought it would be her coming home at that time. It makes my skin crawl to think we were being watched and tracked without either of us realizing. His reaction must have been when he realized he had the wrong mark, and I, for one, would happily smash his creepy face in with a perfume bottle. Also, for anyone wondering, she tried reporting this guy's behavior before, but surprise, surprise, nothing could be done because he technically hadn't done anything. We just notified our other housemate, made sure the house was locked up like Alcatraz, and kept communication open. Never saw or heard of that four-legged man again. So when I was 15, my mom was friends with a man who wanted to date her, Jake. My mom was not interested in a relationship with this man at all and, in fact, was dating another guy by the name of Colt. My family is full of pretty serious rednecks and my mom is no exception. So one day my mom invited Colt and his roommate Frank over to shoot some guns at our home range. We shoot for a while and eventually went in around dark. So my mom and Colt got drunk after we went in. Frank cannot drive due to some brain damage so they ended up staying the night at the house. At around 2am I was still up playing video games. My mom and Colt were in her room asleep when Frankie comes running down the hallway saying a truck just pulled into the driveway. I look out the window and see that it's Jake. Apparently my mom hadn't texted him in a few hours and he's extremely possessive so he went by to check and see if she was home. Keep in mind, Colt's Ranger was parked in the driveway and is very obviously a guy's truck. Think spiked lug nuts, spur hanging from the rear view, skull hydro dip dash. Jake absolutely flips upon seeing this. He starts ringing the doorbell non-stop, beating on the door, walking around the house beating on windows, screaming my mom's name and circling Colt's truck. At this point my mom and Colt are awake and since we have blackout curtains, she tells us to keep the lights off and hide in the hallway, and if we don't do anything and respond, we'll think no one's home and leave. Colt, being completely sober now, is understandably livid, threatening to go out and deal with it as he put it. It's now important to point out the size difference between Colt and Jake. Colt's 5'5 and about 125 pounds soaking wet. Jake is 6'3, 240. Jake could punt Colt 50 feet if he wanted to. Because of this, my mom forces Colt to stay inside. This went on for 45 minutes. At one point we see the camera monitor in my mom's room that Jake has punched the side of Colt's truck. Then we hear the screen to one of the windows slide up. The window in question is locked and Jake couldn't fit through anyway, thank God. It's at this point that I think of the only thing that will make Jake leave. I grab a gun, act terrified, which at this point I am, and walk to the living room and ask, who is it, out the window. Jake realizes it's me and asks where my mom is. I tell him she's out with her friends and that I haven't heard from her and I'll call him when she gets home if I'm awake. He says thank you and left. After all that nonsense he did, that's all it took for him to leave. And honestly, I was amazed. I genuinely thought I was going to have to shoot this guy. Later on that night at around 4, we hear his truck outside again. He squeals his tires down the road, obviously angry that my mom hadn't called him. The next morning, he's back again at 10, again beating on the doors and windows, screaming and trying to get a reaction. Colt again, then tries to go out and handle it, but Mom won't let him. He finally leaves again, and Colt goes out and looks at his truck. There's a three-inch deep dent in the side of his bed. Colt is understandably mad and tells my mom to let him know if that freaking creep comes back. Jake had beat on our doors until his hand bled. This also may have been from hitting the truck, but I don't know, and had blood on the doors and windows. My mom wouldn't let me call the police because she felt that it would just cause unnecessary strain and that she thought it was over, so the cops were unfortunately never involved. She was also worried he'd do worse if the police got involved. 
My mom stopped talking to Jake after that, and I never felt comfortable at that house at night again. Once I started driving, I didn't stay the night there very much, opting to visit during the day and go back to my dad's at night. I've been working for an independent hotel for just over four years. We're the number one rated hotel in our city and proud of it. I mostly work in housekeeping, but I've done some time at the front desk as well. I love my job and I've always said that my bosses are great. Now, being a housekeeper, I've seen some things. I've seen a room where someone snuck in their dog, kitten, and chicken. And we definitely don't allow pets. I once had a room that I was cleaning as a stayover that had tripods set up around the bed, professional camera equipment cases, an adult-sized pacifier, on site, and XL-sized children's diapers. The two people that were in that room were in their early 20s. I even had a room once that we had to call the cops on for a raid because we found meth. They found a lot of drugs and guns in that room. But today, today is the first time I've ever actually felt scared to be in a guest room. As I'm working on a room that's already been vacated, a man in the next room over catches me at my supply cart. He's set to be staying for several days and tells me, you can go ahead and clean my room now. I'm going down for breakfast. Excellent. I love getting my stayovers done early on. It makes things easier for the people working laundry the sooner we get the dirty laundry down to them. So I pop over into his room, opening it up and propping the door open with a stopper like we always do. The first thing I notice is that he has around 20 prescription bottles lined up on one of the two beds, along with insulin and needles. I'm nosy, I'll admit it, and I wanted to see what he was on. Oddly, it was only two different medications for all 20 bottles. About two-thirds were a diabetes medication and the rest were a cholesterol medication. That's a little weird that he had so many bottles of the same meds, but whatever, I thought. I go to make the bed and see that some of the bedding had been stained and sigh. Knowing now I'll have to change all the bedding now instead of just being able to turn down the sheets and blanket. So I leave the room, closing it behind me to go get the linens I needed, then I head right back to the room. I prop the door open again and head to set the clean linens on the desk chair when I see out of the corner of my eye two notes sitting on the TV armoire. It wouldn't mean anything except... I caught the word kill scrawled on it. I dropped the linens and took a closer look. What I read on the first note made my blood run cold. You don't have to forgive her. You just can't kill her. You are here to take money and alcohol away from you. Get over having to kill her and you can safely leave. My heart was pounding. My eyes went to the second note which had just looked like a to-do list at first glance, but in the end made my stomach churn. Spray and wash, apply for Medicare, insubordination. The soul is healed by being with children. Bank card follow-up, inheritance, savings, kawaii pop, 10,500, map Montana, there will be a day of reckoning. Did you tell mom what I said? How did Bev get my address? It was too much. I quickly snapped pictures of them on my phone so I could show my boss why I would not clean his room. I left the room quickly, closing it behind me. As the door closes, I turn and see the man just ten feet away from me coming back to his room. My heart is in my throat, but I manage to smile and tell him, I just need more supplies. I'll be back to your room in a bit. I take off straight for the elevator, having noticed our maintenance man waiting for the slow transport. In a hushed tone, I tell him what I found, and he sees I'm shaken, not a normal state for me. He rides down with me, and I go straight to my boss and tell her that for the first time in all these years, I'm not comfortable being in a guest room. I show her the pictures, and her face is still and pale. She goes to the front desk and asks our general manager for a minute of her time, and brings her into the office to show her. She agreed. This was not a safe situation, and took our maintenance man with her to go inform the man he had one hour to get his belongings and leave the hotel, and he was not welcome back. I spent a few minutes in the laundry room trying to calm down, then my boss went back up with me to the floor until the man was 
officially out of the hotel. I don't know who Bev is. I don't know who the woman is that he didn't feel he needed to forgive. But man in room 422, don't you ever come back. So this is a story from around 10 years ago. I was 16 or 17 at the time, but but I recently discovered this sub and it instantly brought these memories flooding back to me. At the time, I kind of just brushed it off because nothing bad ended up happening to me and put it down to, I guess stuff just happens to you when you're a woman walking alone at night. But looking back, I now realize how incredibly creepy it truly was. I was coming home on my own on a Thursday night after being out at a pub with some friends. We had been out a little more centrally in the city, so I had to take a bus on my own to get home to my residential neighborhood. I had done this route hundreds of times, so I didn't see it as being particularly dangerous, especially as I live in a fairly nice neighborhood. It was only about 11pm, but because I lived in a residential area, and it was the middle of the working week, when I got off the bus at my stop, it was absolutely dead and there was no one around. Again, this didn't spook me, particularly as it was only about a 5-10 to 10 minute walk from the bus stop to my house. As I turned down a long residential street that leads towards my house, I noticed a guy walking further down the street. This put me a little on edge, but I was reassured by the fact that he has his back to me and was walking away from me down the street. As I kept walking down the street, I noticed the guy turn around and clock me. Mm, that's fine, I thought. I always turn around when I hear someone walking behind me at night, so nothing truly weird about that. But I noticed as we got further and further down the street, he kept doing it. Kept checking, I was still walking in the same direction as him. At this point, I'm starting to get pretty freaked out. Particularly as I am painfully aware that we're the only two people around. Just as I was weighing up what I should do, he turned down the path of one of the houses to our right and I breathed a sigh of relief. He is going into the house, I thought. I was just being paranoid the whole time. Now the houses in my area are terraced with the front doors being kind of embedded into an enclave at the front of the house. What this means is that from where I was standing, about 50 feet away, I couldn't actually see the front door of the house as it was obscured by the wall. However, I saw him walk down the path and disappear into the front door enclave, so my logical conclusion was that he was letting himself into his own home. I can't describe what exactly made me feel like this, but after that initial feeling of relief wore off, I suddenly got this really bad feeling, so I stopped walking and just stood there. There was this tiny voice in my head that said, what if he was just faking you out? The feeling became so strong that I stepped off the pavement and ducked down behind a parked car and just waited. After a couple of minutes of crouching behind the car staring at the house, I saw a movement and my heart stopped. The man came back down the path, out into the street and was looking around, very clearly looking for me. He must have been waiting for me in the doorway knowing that if I kept walking I wouldn't see him until it was too late. Unfortunately for him, his hiding place also meant that he couldn't see me, so when I didn't walk past as he anticipated, he had come back out into the street to try and work out where I was. Looking back now, I probably should have called the police at this point, but as a scared teenager, my fight or flight brain took over and I sprinted down one of the roads running perpendicular to the street that we were on, as I knew I could use it to take a slightly longer route home. I didn't stop running until I got home where I quickly double locked the door behind me, and amazingly, I didn't even think to wake anyone in my family up. I literally just went to bed, and then woke up the next morning and went to school. I dread to think what would have happened if I hadn't just suddenly got a bad feeling and stopped walking. Part of me thinks that on some subconscious level my brain must have registered not hearing the front door shut after the man had approached it and therefore triggered an alarm in my head. But I had no perception of this at the time. Lesson learned. Trust your gut. This happened in 2019. 
I was in my second year of college and living in a townhome about a ten minute walk from campus. I lived there with two other girls at the time, but they were all back at their parents' house for the holiday. I work in healthcare and was working Christmas this year. Now a little bit of backstory, there used to be four of us living there, but one girl had moved out due to issues with her boyfriend. He was a jerk who abused our kindness on allowing him to stay there, was only supposed to come every so often, but basically ended up living there. We told her she needed to kick him out after an incident with him one night after he got physical with her and verbally abusive with the rest of us. She wouldn't listen, and we told her we would have to talk to the landlord then. Long story short, she ended up moving out and left on bad terms with us. On another side, not here, I have been in physically and mentally abusive relationships before, so I understand how things may have been going for her. I tried my best for two years at that point to help open her eyes to the abuse and get her away from him. At this point it was affecting everyone and we didn't feel safe with him there, so she moved out. Now back to the story, it was Christmas Eve and I worked the next day so I was getting ready for bed. Locked the doors, turned the lights off and went downstairs where my bedroom was. I was scrolling through TikTok for about an hour, it was Christmas day at this point, when I heard what sounded like the chairs in the kitchen move. The kitchen is right above my bedroom. I thought maybe I was hearing the neighbors next door as we share the same walls and sometimes they can be loud. But I remember one of them texting me and asking me to bring in a package they were expecting while they were all gone at home. The noise was short lived so I just brushed it off. Next thing I know, my bedroom door is being opened slowly. In this moment I get a flashback and remember my second grade teacher telling us about the time someone broke into her house and she acted as if though she were asleep so if they were just there to rob her they wouldn't feel the need to hurt her if she saw them. But my freaking phone screen is lighting up my scared jaw drop face so I can't act like I'm asleep. Where I'm laying in bed it faces directly to the door so we're just looking right at each other. So there I was, lying in bed, soiling myself while this guy has one foot in the bedroom with the door cracked open. It felt like an eternity, but in reality it was more like ten seconds of us looking at one another. He slowly takes his foot out and closes my door. I sit there just in complete and utter shock. I couldn't make out what he looked like as my eyes were adjusting to the dark again from the phone screen, and all I could see was a backwards baseball cap. I knew I had to call the police, but my anxious mind knew if I called it, it would alert my parents' phones that I called. Me, being dumb, was like, well, I don't want to make them worry. Also, I was scared that he might still be somewhere in the house, and I didn't know what he would do if he heard me call. So I texted the guy I was seeing at the time and tell him, some random guy just broke into my house and came to my room. He snapped me out of it and told me to call the police, and so I did. The dispatcher asked me if I felt comfortable to go unlock the front door for them so they didn't have to break it down, and I told her no way, I don't care if the door is broken, I'm not going up there alone. A couple of minutes later I see flashlights shining through my window. I hear the police knocking at my door and announcing themselves. They got in and asked me where I was. I came out of my room and they came and got me. They told me to wait on the back porch while two of them searched the house and one stayed with me. It was like the stuff you see in movies where they have their guns and turn the corner with their partner and everything. They didn't find anyone and I said nothing looked like it had been taken. They even tried to get fingerprints but were unsuccessful. They then started asking me questions and informed me that the back door was unlocked and had no signs it had been broken and I told them I locked it. Luckily the guy I was talking to stayed with me that night but I still couldn't sleep. I kept having to check every inch of the house over and over. I even placed chairs under the door handles on the front door, back door, and my bedroom. And the next day I informed our landlord and she refused to come out and change the locks, and she never ended up changing them for the rest of the time we lived there. Every time I go to bed now I triple check all the doors have been locked and it doesn't matter where I am. I have a dog now and he helps my anxiety of intruders, as well as a recent purchase of a ring doorbell. I believe it was our old roommate's boyfriend. I think they may have made an extra key for him because he was basically living there. But I don't understand why he didn't do anything to me, the house, or our belongings. If it was someone random I don't know 
why they wouldn't have done what they intended, and that could have been many, many different possibilities. I'm 5'3", 115 pounds, so I guess I'm pretty small. That's my reasoning for being very submissive over all of this. This is a lengthy story, so I'm just going to skim, and I'm not the best at storytelling, so prepare yourself. When I started working at this fast food chain, I was 16. It was my first job, and I was excited to finally take my first steps into adulthood. This co-worker of mine was training me. For privacy purposes, I'm going to call him Frank. Frank, at first glance, looks young, 19, 21 at the most. We got along, and nothing wasn't too bad nor alarming, like conversations about anime and such. I remember things started to change slightly when he was talking about a video game character, and none of our coworkers knew who it was. When I saw the green hat character, I said, Oh, that's Link. How cute. I used to watch my brother play Legend of Zelda Four Swords. He looked at me and said, Marry me. I laughed it off and continued on with my day. For the rest of my shift, he would hover over me asking me personal questions like my age, favorite things, etc. Being the open, friendly person I was, I answered happily. I told him how I loved butterflies and that I was 16. I'm 17 now and have had several jobs since. When an older man asks for my age as a minor, it's never a nice sign. Moving on to December, I've been at this chain for a month now. My manager asked me if I wanted to come to their company's secret Santa party, and I agreed. When the day came, I arrived with my now ex-boyfriend. Frank arrives on the phone acting busy and such, but I thought nothing of it. During the whole party, he was on the phone. I was getting food when he tapped my shoulder, still on the phone, and handed me a beautiful butterfly necklace. I didn't know what to say besides thanking him, thinking he was my secret Santa or something. Then later, my other coworker comes up to me handing me a gift card to Starbucks and a plush. I asked why and she said she was my secret Santa. I thought it must have been a mistake and went on with my night, listening to my old best friend tell me how I should date Frank, which in my mind was never on the table. January rolls around and was Frank's birthday. We were just working until I heard one of my girl coworkers, who was into him at the time, wish him a happy birthday. Being that person, I wish him happy birthday while my other co-worker asks how old he's turning. He said 27. Might I add that every shift I worked with him, he would take several photos of me before and after my shift, commenting about my hair, my skin, and eyes. Often said how cute my nose was. Again, not wanting to cause a scene, I just laugh everything off. That's always the case, isn't it? We don't want to cause a scene. I did start telling him to please stop, but of course he wouldn't no matter how many times I asked him to. And now I'm going to skip to May, my birthday month, and of course I was working on my birthday. I went to the back door as usual. Due to COVID, I had to ring a doorbell and wait for someone to open the door. Out of nowhere, Frank pops out of the bushes, handing me all kinds of gifts. Today was his day off too, so I was generally confused. I remember thinking, how did he know it was my birthday? I never talk about it since I don't like celebrating it. He followed me around for a few minutes before awkwardly leaving when I apologized that I want to get to work and not get yelled at. In July is when I finally found a new job. I quit due to harassment I had to endure for the nine months I worked there from my shift leader. That's a whole other story, but when a man starts getting handsy, don't laugh it off. Shut that down quick. It got really bad when that ex-best friend of mine that I mentioned earlier started showing all my coworkers, including Frank and that shift lead, explicit photos of me that she stole off my phone without me knowing. I was very insecure at the time and was in an abusive relationship, so I would give anything this boy asked of me. Anyways, at this point, I had about had it. After being interrogated about that shift lead, I put in my two weeks. On my last week... Everyone was talking about how that shift lead got laid off for harassment, and Frank and I were doing dishes and the topic came up. I awkwardly told him about it, now knowing how everyone knew my story. The shift lead would often grab my butt, rub my thigh, talk about my chest about how, if they were bigger, and things that he would do to my body. I would say to stop politely, but he would continue. 
and when I started yelling and saying stop more assertively, he would often make me do a humiliating task like clean the greasy floor on my hands and knees or cleaning the dining room when it was closed due to COVID. When I told Frank this, he shrugged it off and said there was no reason for him to be fired. I remember being absolutely shocked, retorting, Ugh, I'm just glad I'm leaving this hellhole, and I left it at that. A month into my new job as a hostess, everything was going well. It's a restaurant, but everyone just comes there to drink so it's more of a bar. On one of my 2am shifts, Frank stops by on his bike. I try to be friendly, but was getting frustrated when he kept cutting me off from talking to other people. I then walk away to bus tables because no one else would do it, and he wouldn't follow me into the restaurant as there was outdoor seating at that time. After bussing all the tables, I come up to the counter to see my coworkers giggling. What's happening? I asked. The other hostess smiled. That's so cute how your boyfriend takes photos of you while you're working. That's so cute how obsessive he is over you. He wouldn't stop talking about you to us. Boyfriend? I responded. I was and still happily remain single after all this nonsense of a relationship. The only person they could be referring to at that time was Frank. Then it dawned on me. How did he know where I was working in my shift schedule? I didn't tell anyone beside my parents and my brother. A week goes by and Frank comes back. I may have gotten a little overdramatic, but I didn't know what else to do. I told the other host at the counter to tell him I'm not working today and dashed inside. I told my manager that this man, Frank, keeps taking photos of me as I'm working and it's making me very uncomfortable. My manager told me to stay in the back room while he went and handled the situation. Their restaurant is very popular in the area, so it's very crowded in the front. Frank had his bike and was blocking customers and that's when my manager went to talk to him. My stupid self was popping my head out a little under that back room window where I could see what was going on in the front. I freak out a little when I see Frank get aggressive with my manager. He begins thrashing when my manager tries to lead him out the front. Suddenly, Frank throws his bike and tries heading into the building. A few male waiters see what's happening and were informed by my manager. I remember one waiter standing in the back room with me watching the door as another was practically fighting with Frank. I could only hear yelling outside the door and then it went quiet. I spent the rest of the shift like that, cleaning silverware with that male server and from then on, people would walk me to my car even if it was broad daylight. From August to November, he would be on his bike passing by the restaurant from a distance. He would just be watching and taking photos for maybe 10 to 20 minutes before leaving. Now the reason I thought of putting this here was now it's been a little more intense because just the looking from a distance. Due to COVID, I'm not needed anymore because now my restaurant is takeout only. I've been working seasonal jobs while working at the restaurant, but now I'm not working and I'm waiting to get my schedule. Because I was bored this day, I drive to my local mall just to do a little Christmas shopping. While driving, I look in my rearview mirror to see a recognizable face. It was Frank. I practically choke on spit seeing his face in my mirror. I try not to get the best of myself and brush it off as just some sort of coincidence. It wasn't. He followed me through the mall, then later followed me as I was driving. No one knows where I live besides that old friend, and I'd like to keep it like that. So I drove for an hour, getting lost and taking every random turn I could until I lost him. I now believe this is how he would track me down. My car isn't common, but it doesn't stand out too much. I've rarely left my house since. It's January 2021, and ever since the start of this new year... I've been getting phone calls going like this. Hello? Breathing into the phone like a creep. Hello? And the call ends. Along with that, I've gotten many random messages asking about gifts and delivering me a gift. I'm not one who usually uses social media, but these messages were all over mine. All of them were from newly made accounts across Snapchat and Instagram. On one occasion, an account started sending me photos... Photos that I've never sent to anyone. These photos were photos of my cat and I think that I saved in my Snapchat album. Just photo after photo of things I've never sent and ending with, I have a gift for you. I deleted both apps along with deleting almost everything off my phone. A week ago I downloaded Snap again due to some dumb assignment my teacher wanted us to do with that stupid social media app. 
one of my old co-workers sent me a message. I open it. Frank wants to give you your Christmas gift. Want to stop by? Maybe I'm just overreacting. Or maybe those accounts were Frank. I just want to say my personality has changed because of all of this. I'm a very guarded person now. Rarely talk to anybody. Not as friendly as I was then. It's only been a little over a year, yet I feel like I've aged 10 plus. This happened in 2008 when I was 9 years old. I lived in a townhome community where each road had two sides of homes. In between the backs of the houses, there was a back road with alleys that went in between each building section. I lived on the edge of one of these and my townhome was on one of the alleyways. I lived on one street and across the back road on the opposite side lived an elderly woman whose name I don't even know. I'm not sure what her situation was, but for whatever reason, she never really liked me specifically. She was creepy and spray painted all of her windows so no one could see in her house. However, that never stopped her from sometimes staring out her bedroom window directly at mine and keeping it open at night to shine a red strobe light into my room across the way. She used to yell how she hated us. I was in the fourth grade, and on a particular January morning I had unfortunately missed the bus. My dad sent me outside to get in the car so he could drive me, and he said he'd follow me out soon after. As I was walking to my dad's car, she came out of the alleyway next to my house, slowly, with a gigantic kitchen knife behind her back. She raised it and started running after me. I was faster than her, so I was able to avoid her and was able to get into the house. She walked and stood on the neighbor's porch across the way and stared at my house. I was terrified. My dad ran out and yelled at her, and she said she wanted to get rid of us stupid kids. My parents called the police, but the police sent her home and had an ambulance pick her up later. My parents went to some kind of court meeting about it, but I don't really know the details. I didn't see her again after that until about one year later. I don't remember the day, but it had snowed that morning, so I was going to run out of the front door and play in the snow. I opened the door to see her standing on the porch, but looking out towards the road. I panicked, closed, and locked the door. I ran up to my parents' room and told them what happened, and we saw her walk off the porch up the street. I never saw her again after that. My family has since moved far away from there, but people I know say she still lives there and her windows are still the same spray-painted windows. Though it doesn't affect me as much as it used to, I still don't like being around. Knives. The indigenous people of Australia have up to 75 different dialects, depending on the region where they come from. So the name of this being could be called something entirely different in the other dialects, but my local tribe called it the Kardashian Man. Growing up in an outback town, you get a lot of freedom you take for granted, but that freedom could also get you in trouble, big trouble. This occurred when I was about 11 years old, in my hometown. My Aboriginal friend and I were walking around town, bored out of our brains during school holidays. The rest of our friends had gone away for the holidays. So we decided to go fishing in a secret spot, down by the old Aboriginal encampment, which was about 15 kilometers out of town. We headed around to the butchery to pick up some meat for yabbies, to his house for rods and traps, and then my house for food, drinks, and a shovel. We planned to dig for worms out by the river. We got all the necessary supplies and headed out along the side of the highway. We were walking and talking and stuffing around when we finally got there. We headed down the sand road and came across a fence that blocked off the sacred land. There was a statue of some sort on the boundary and my mate stopped and said a few words. He always said that his dad told him to do it, otherwise the bad spirits could see us. I told him that was silly and skipped it. We go down the back of the camp and walk on another kilometer or so and find our spot. All the noises of the bush were there, 
and there was a nice breeze blowing through the old ghost gums. We could see the fish jumping and knew we were in for a good day. We started digging around for worms and came up with a few big good ones and got to fishing. The day gets on and it turns out that we are terrible fishermen with rods. So we abandon them and get into the water to catch with our hands. Turns out I'm also terrible at that but my mate ends up catching a decent sized yellow belly. So we keep her eating and showing off. We hadn't kept an eye on the time and before we knew it, the sun had set. My friend starts getting really nervous, saying that it's time to get out of there and we really need to leave. I ask why and he says that it's really unsafe to be there after dark. I laugh and at that exact moment there is a huge splash in the water behind us. We both shit a little bit but with our child bravery we check it out and can't see a thing. Just ripples on top of the water. We dismiss it as a big fish and start to pack up our stuff to leave. By the time we start our march back, it is pitch black. We can barely see our hands in front of us and forgot to pack a torch, so we kind of fumble our way through the bush until our eyes adjusted. We are walking for about 20 minutes when we stop. We can hear heavy footsteps to our left about 15 meters away. We strain our hearing and the footsteps stop. We then realize that the bush is silent. No wind, nothing. Our eyes have adjusted to the dark so we can kind of see where we're going. And we realize we have overshot the road by about half a kilometer. And whatever was making those footsteps was between us and the road. So we decide to push on and come out along the highway further up the road. That was a mistake. The footsteps kept persisting, sometimes closer and sometimes further away. I swear at times I could hear a low mumbling. I kept saying to my friend but he told me to shut up and don't look back. He can't see us was what he kept saying. So I push on, my feeling getting more and more uneasy. The next second we hear a loud crash come from our left on the small animal trail we were on and my mate grabs me and pulls me off into the scrub and tells me to lay down. As we're laying there we see a silhouette loom up to the path. It kind of has the outline of feathers on it and is ungodly tall and humanoid but sickly thin. It is going from tree to tree, not very far from us and is looking around, snapping its head and making a low mumbling sound as it moves. It was looking for us. It keeps moving around where we were standing, and suddenly stops and stoops, looking back down the path where we hear what could have been a kangaroo jump off into the bush. The being lets out an unearthly scream that hurts our ears and shoots off down the path faster than anything I've ever seen. I looked to my mate and whispered to him if he had just seen what I had. But when I looked, he had his head in his hands the whole time. He answered, we're not allowed to look. His cheeks were all tear stained and then he whispered, I told you he would see you. We waited for what felt like two hours and bailed out of the bushes and ran the remaining distance to the town, losing our fish along the way and some of our stuff. We finally made it and every time I tried to bring it up with him, he told me to shut my mouth or it would come back. So I eventually stopped trying. I haven't been able to sleep right since. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video.
And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon. Or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And I'll see you again soon.